my book is called Learning to Live with Climate Change and it is uh, sort of, uh, it's a book about climate change engagement, um, but also about a bigger sort of sociological process um, that I term learning to live with climate change. And it's responding to, I guess, two sort of problems or issues um, that I think exist in the way that we uh, think about climate change engagement. So the first is to do with uh, cultures of denial. And so I'm sure you're all very aware of uh, the strength of the climate denial uh, system in Australia. Typically, when we think of climate denial, we think of people like Tony Abbott that say that climate change isn't real or it's not happening or it's not bad anyway. Um, but most of the polling and surveying shows that in countries like Australia, most people actually do understand the basics of climate science. Most people believe in climate change. Most people are concerned about it, but very few are actively engaged with it. Um, and very few actively talk about it with their friends and family, um, and very few prioritize it at an election. So they're concerned about it, but it's not high enough on that list of things for them to feel um, that it's their thing. And so as you would know, in Citizens Climate Lobby, um, you know, if we want systemic change, we need everyday people and heaps and heaps of them to be pressuring governments. So we, it's easy to focus on the explicit climate denial, but um, in some ways it's not, it's not the Tony Abbotts that are such an issue so much as the everyday people out there who say, if you ask them, will say that they care about climate change, but when you ask them what they're doing, they're not really doing anything. And it's easy to think that that's because people don't care, but most of the research would tell us that in fact, it's that people don't know how to care or how to act on that care and that they don't feel empowered to act on that. And so feelings of um, hopelessness or not feeling able to achieve what you want um, is often what's driving what looks like apathy and disengagement. Um, on the other hand, because climate change is such a big, scary issue, as lots of you mentioned, um, and because it is really hard work for us to get our really deeply um, carbon intensive societies to change, burnout and anxiety and mental health issues are a big problem for people who do engage with climate change, um, either intensely or over the longer term. So a lot of my work is around climate anxiety and what that, what it feels like to engage with climate change as a sort of idea um, and then how we can respond to that in productive ways. The other thing um, that I, I think is an issue that's under addressed in um, our efforts to respond to climate change is sort of cultures of control. So I understand climate change to be, uh, I guess, one manifestation of this deep-seated cultural uh, belief that humans are separate from the environment and also that we're able to control it if we, if we want. And the question then becomes getting enough people to want to manage it the right way. Uh, so, um, you know, we have these sort of responses to climate change that are really uh, technocentric, such as carbon capture and storage, um, or uh, the more sort of out there ones like the solar radiation management, which is effectively, you know, mirrors in space or those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, some of them have a bit of value, but we invest so much effort in terms of time and money into these um, solutions that are really just about changing technology, basically on the premise that um, if we just cared enough, we would be able to manipulate the climate to sort of produce whatever we want it to be. Um, kind of like, you know, just turning the thermostat on the oven to whatever temperature you want it to be. Um, and a lot of our climate, climate change engagement strategies also have a, it's more subtle, but still a bit of a culture of control embedded within that. 
which is around, you know, for example, if it's in a classroom, it's about getting um, the children to understand the facts or the right way. Um, it's often around uh, those of us who are trying to engage other people come up with a sort of prescriptive set of ideas of what the right way to respond to climate change is and sort of try to convince them to participate in what we really decided upon. Um, and so a lot of the language is about acting on climate rather than say acting with climate or for climate or those sorts of things. Um, so my work is trying to, I guess, address both of these sorts of issues around the denial of the emotional intensity of climate change, as well as um, how we can be, I think, both more humble, but also more ambitious when it comes to addressing climate change as well. Um, so this idea of learning to live with climate change is sort of operating in two key ways. And the first is just, you know, that we need people to understand that we're part of the climate and that, you know, the climate and the planet more generally is this massive set of relationships uh, that all are participating in what the climate becomes, obviously humans and or, or our fossil fueled economic practices are having a disastrous impact, but they're not the only practices or, and we're not the only beings that actually contribute to what the climate becomes. And it's easy to forget that when the ways that we're contributing to climate change are so out of proportion. Um, and so that first part is just, I guess, about, you know, we often talk in environmental sort of spaces around being connected with nature and those sorts of things. So it's generally, I guess, about appreciating that interconnectedness with the non-human world. Um, often though, when we talk about trying to get people to appreciate being connected to nature, it's presumed that that's kind of a nice thing. Um, but as you know, some of you identified just earlier, when we come to terms with our interconnectedness with climate change, that's the scary bit. You know, it's because we're so interconnected with climate change that, you know, these uh, subsistence farmers in India are, you know, losing their livelihoods in, in one monsoon. And it's because of our interconnectedness that, you know, when we have those bushfires that we have asthmatic, like 400 asthmatics dying over the summer and those sorts of things. And again, it's because of that interconnectedness that we're changing the climate. So even the most skeptical um, people in the world didn't intend to create climate change. It's an unintended consequence of our um, participation in the world. Uh, and so to learn about and engage with climate change and to appreciate our interconnectedness, I think is inherently these days a deeply distressing process. And I think that's under acknowledged a lot of the time. Um, so because, uh, because we don't pay attention to, sorry, I'm just going to full screen that. I didn't realize I hadn't done that. Because we don't pay attention to those emotional dimensions often enough, I think that's where a lot of the disengagement on climate change uh, comes from. So in response to that, I think um, we need to engage in what I call affective transformation. So this is kind of like emotional resilience or coping, but I just don't, I don't like those terms because they feel a bit like um, just getting on with it or accepting climate change or um, learning how to be okay with it. And it's not okay. And, you know, a bad outcome I think would be if we took people who were worried about climate change and helped them feel that it would be okay. Um, what we really need is people to be able to sit with the discomfort that climate change uh, generates and to find ways to engage with that discomfort and use that discomfort as a source of, uh, I guess, motivation and strength to really transform the ways that we live in the world. So I thought I'd give you a couple of just quick examples to explain that a little bit more. Um, so I've been thinking more generally about a, a bigger understanding of climate just as a set of, or climate as feeling. 
So we often use like weather related phrases to talk about how we're feeling like being under the, under the weather or on cloud nine and those sorts of things. And I think when we think about why climate matters, it matters because of the ways that it makes us feel. Um, and so this is, uh, this is an image that was shown in one of our classes when we had a guest lecturer in 2015 in the class that I was teaching that year. So this is a photo of a family uh, sheltering from a, a bushfire in Tasmania in 2013. Um, it's quite a distressing image and uh, it's worth noting that the family survived and they're all okay. Um, so this was shown in a lecture and the guest lecturer was talking quite a bit about bushfires. And then later in my tutorial that day, one of my students mentioned in a sort of passing comment that he was in a fiery mood. Um, and it took me a while to really think about this, but then going back and looking through the lecture notes and I was perplexed as to whether all this discussion around bushfires is what kind of created that fiery mood or to what extent there was a connection between the lecture content and his uh, effective experience. And since picking up on that, I've noted how frequently people um, have emotional experiences uh, that kind of have some sort of affinity to the actual climatic event. So for example, over the recent bushfires, uh, recent summer here with the bushfires and the smoke in Sydney, I heard a couple of different people on separate occasions say that they were fuming and, you know, just thinking about uh, all the imagery and the smoke all around us of just the, these fumes of incinerated um, bush just really got me thinking about that as well. And so I think, you know, we talk about, or we understand climate change is uh, scientific, a technological and economic and environmental issue, but I really think we need to understand it as an emotional issue as well. And I think that through doing that, we can really tap into people's um, experiences and meanings and make things more relevant to them. So I thought I'd read you a short excerpt from one of my students' assignments. This is also from 2015 and um, I'll read it out to you. Um, so this is at the end of the semester and the student writes, it's so overwhelming to travel overseas and see the big contrast while we and Western society hyper consume and waste everything. Yet there are countries who can barely find enough food for one meal a day. What gets me the most is that the societies and the people that contribute most to climate change are the ones that will be least affected. What happened to karma? That just makes me so angry. In fact, we are the ones who cause most of these issues and for them to be given the consequences, this often develops some sort of anxiety in me or even just a mild sick feeling, the feeling of not being able to predict the future and predict the best thing to do whilst minimising as much harm as possible. This feeling often comes by me when I watch how the leaders of Australia approach issues like these and it makes me feel sick. It is such an emotional challenge to deal with, especially when you accept the fact that you and the society we live in today is to blame. Ignorance is bliss because on a daily basis, I feel like I'm not doing enough but I don't know what else I can do. Um, so obviously this is a you know, challenging piece of writing to receive as an assignment that you then have to grade and give a, a numerical score to. Um, so that's one of the challenging things about teaching climate change. But I guess for our purposes here, one of the things that I take from this piece of writing is how much the student's sense of self is changing. Um, through her engagement and her emotional experiences of climate change as well. So she begins to both distance herself and connect herself to other groups of people, um, sort of changing uh, how she identifies in relation to those groups in society. But also that her sense of her ability to, you know, go out and achieve what she wants or to have control over her future is also really being undermined. Um, and so this is, I guess, part of what I'm talking about is this process of learning to live with climate change is that the more that we engage with it, the more frustrating and overwhelming um, it becomes. And despite all of our best efforts, you know, we just eventually realise that we don't have control over this really complex system. And that's not to say that there aren't things that we can do and that we can't make radical changes, but that I, 
I think that climate change itself is a teacher that is teaching us that we, we don't have control over the world. Um, the final example I'll speak to you about is, uh, these are some photos from the Extinction Rebellion People's Climate Assembly last year in September in Melbourne. Um, and they were talking about climate justice. So on the left is the whiteboard that someone was taking notes around um, the things that people were saying. And the photo of the people is them having that discussion. And so I think that in this little moment, you can see people sort of really grappling with the challenges that come with being privileged people living on, you know, colonized land. Um, and having to take accountability for those histories as well as how that affects the, the kind of futures that we can generate together. Um, and talking about, you know, these really challenging, distressing situations, but also sitting with each other um, and working to create something better. And so this is, I guess, another way that I try to express what I'm getting at, which is around um, this idea of bearing worlds. So, both like engaging in the labor of enduring the pain um, that it takes to really sit with what climate change is, is showing us while also working to generate alternatives um, and building in this case, like a little world of people that are, um, you know, really working hard to rethink things and um, readjust their expectations and their, uh, what they can do and where they want to take these sorts of things. Um, so just to wrap up, um, yeah, part of this project is a, a bigger kind of argument around climate as feeling. Uh, and I really like this phrase from, um, a Canadian Indigenous scholar, Zoe Todd, who refers to climate as a sentient commons. Um, and I think as a settler person, I'm only able to engage with that. Like, I think there's a lot more there than what I'm able to grasp. Um, but so for me as someone who engages a lot with young people and a lot with uh, young people who are really distressed about climate change, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that facing up to and engaging with that distress is a really important way that we can um, let go of that kind of colonial sense of trying to master the world, um, but also come out of there, not with a sense that we just let the polluters get away with it, um, but that are a really uh, collective sense that we can create a different world, but that that can only happen through um, respect for uh, the more than human world. And so part of this is understanding climate change, not as something that we just learn about, but that climate change is a teacher and that through engaging with climate change as a teacher, we can learn um, to really radically kind of change how we're trying to live on this planet. Um, and so I think that that's a process that's already unfolding. And so I see that happening in the school strikes for climate, for example. So um, the photo on the right here is from the Brisbane school strike last September. Um, and I really think that this placard kind of encapsulates what I'm trying to speak to where this um, young woman has, you know, like reusing this hour and we like a collective sense that she a collective identity that she is speaking about not just using you know first person um perspectives um and feeling you know that when the forests burn we burn when the storms are raging we're raging um but also that sitting with that is not about becoming complacent or turning away but that you know that phrase that the school strikers are using a lot as the oceans rise so do we um is really i guess what i'm what i see is happening and hope is happening as well um so that's all i'm going to talk about for now um and i hope that in some ways that was somehow of use for you but um, i'm happy to take any questions or comments on sort of climate change engagement strategies or communication education those sorts of things as well um, and yeah thank you so much for inviting me along to do this it's a real privilege so 